Hey, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the Mission Manhood Podcast. Today my guest is Luke Smith, and I met Luke when I was having a personal crisis, which you'll hear a little bit more about in the episode. And Luke shares his story of losing his identity and then finding new life. I believe it's really important to establish a firm foundation by taking the time and having the courage to examine your wounds. And Luke is a really great example of how powerful that can be. If you've been following along, thank you so much. I hope you'll take the time to subscribe and if possible, leave a review. I hope you enjoy the episode and thank you so much for joining. Hello and welcome to the Mission Manhood Podcast. Today, my guest is Luke Smith. Hi, Luke. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, yes. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So I want to tell the audience a little bit about how we met. I was at a particular time in my life when I felt like I was swirling into chaos, like there was nothing to grab onto. And the reason why is because my oldest child, we had been a baseball family. And I felt like when we got to high school and he made the team, we made it, I could kind of relax a little bit. And the second year of high school, despite his record the year before and how he had contributed, he got cut after the tryouts. And it was one of those things that I was shocked by. We were actually getting ready to go celebrate. When the the list came out, his name wasn't on it. His number wasn't on it. That just started the chaos there of, and I think we've talked about this, you know, your whole identity is kind of stripped from you. Yeah. And so I'm scrambling trying to figure anything out. And I don't know how I got your name, but for whatever reason, I found you and you said, sure, I can meet with you guys. (laughs) Yeah. And my son had just sent me, a text message saying, can you get me out of this class? (laughs) So it was like divine intervention. I'm like, yes, I can get you out, but I want you to go meet with this guy. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. (laughs) We met at a Mexican restaurant. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the minute that we walked in, I felt like I kind of receded into the background, like I was a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I felt for the first time he had something to grab onto. And you just so generously shared your story and what you'd been through and just kind of man to man told him you have options. I really just appreciate that so much. It's so vital, I believe for young men to hear from an older man that it's okay to feel the way you feel. Matter of fact, you, you, you need to kind of sit in that feeling and, and acknowledge it. If you don't acknowledge the emotions that you're having, then there's no way that you can, for lack of a better term, conquer them or, or keep them at bay. Um, as men, we're, we're taught to suppress by culture. And if we suppress what, what happens, I see it much like a seed, especially negative um, emotions or negative thoughts to where if we, if we bury them under whatever soil we have, all they're going to do is grow roots. And then they're going to grow into something exponentially larger and cover more ground. And, yeah, and, and pop out in unexpected oh, places. <laughs> and, and no, they're going to, exactly. They're going to pop out when you're 35 years old and married with kids and, you know, not understand why you're going through a level of depression that you're having. I, I watched my father do that. That's the, that's the reference I'm going to there. He had no idea. And um, he got to the crux of it, but, you know, it took him three years. And it, it, it almost destroyed our family um, and made our family stronger in the end. But, you know, I remember sitting across from your son and, and just I don't remember the conversation, obviously, but it was the heart of it is, like you said, identity. And as a, as a man, as a young man, for me coming up, my identity was wrapped in, in the game, too, is wrapped up in baseball. And a lot of times I feel like as men, we're, we're told what our identity is supposed to be, but nobody ever teaches you how to deal with the failure aspect of that. So whenever you don't live up to the expectations that you've built in your mind, 
you feel like you didn't just let yourself down, but you let everyone around you who's been telling you who you're supposed to be, you let them down. And that is a dark, dark hole that many young men and older men, you know, deal with in isolation. And that goes exactly back to what you're saying. They don't know how to deal with it. They've not been taught how to deal with it. So they stuff it Mm -hmm. and try that fake it till you make it thing. And then it pops out at some other unexpected time. Uh, I'm a walking example of it. You have to have somebody that knows you that has unbridled open communication to talk to you. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting. My last guest and I talked about that. That was one of his things that men need safe places to be open and honest. And it's Mm -hmm. really so rare that you find someone that's not going to thump you on the head like an older brother or, (laughs) you know, tell you to get over it. What's wrong with you? And just the ability to kind of go to that deeper place and hold the space for someone where they feel safe enough to express their inner emotions. I I have been fortunate to where I've been a part of the same men's group. We meet every Thursday morning at 630 for about 13 years now. That has taught me so much. Just to give you one last example on how it's important. I believe anybody that's listening, it's, you know, if you're a man, find, find a group. You know, I was going through something very, very tough. And I remember I was driving down the highway here and uh, the elder of the group, the, the oldest guy, he, he was, uh, he's a surgeon. And I sent him a text. I said, I need five minutes from you. I know you're busy. I need five minutes. And he was like, I got about five minutes. That's it. Meet me at the Starbucks <laughs> on this corner. Pulled over, got out, sat at a table, told him, hey, man, like, this is what's going on with me. And I was just going through some stuff where I, I, I knew that I needed, I wasn't acting the way I should act in different places. And he looked up at me with the most loving eyes on the planet. And he said, stop. I said, do what? He was like, just stop doing it. You've confessed this to me. Great. Stop doing it. He said, it's that easy. Whatever it is, you know, whatever the the situation was, he's like, just stop. And he was like, do you need anything else? I was like, (laughs) no. He goes, okay, I have to go perform surgery on a three week old baby. I'll see you a little bit, you know? And so, but this man who, who lives a life of life and death every minute, you know, I sent him a text said, Hey, I need you. He dropped everything he was doing, gave me his five minutes, gave me the best wisdom I could have received yeah. at that moment in my life. And it, it is stay with me. Anytime I feel myself doing some things or getting in a rut where it's going to destroy me or has the potential to destroy me, I hear him just say, hey, Luke, stop. And that's because of walking you know, so long with him and feeling safe. So I think it's vital. In any given situation, in a true brotherhood, you might need to be thumped on the head or you might need somebody to cry with you. And mm-hmm. I think you're meant to be like a shapeshifter emotionally. You know what's needed in this situation because you have discernment. Yeah. And especially if you, if you know each other, right? Yeah, exactly. You've built this relationship. Yeah. It's very difficult to walk up to a stranger and expect some feedback that is extremely helpful. You know, that's, that's different. So. And someone that you've you've built that with and invested that time with, it's possible that in five minutes he knows your heart, he knows your backstory, he knows everything about you, mm-hmm. and that that is enough. These four or five men who I've been sitting down having coffee with for thirteen years, there's just a different level of, like I said, it's it's knowing someone. Just for kind of a foundational thing, I wondered, could you just tell your story where? You were going in a certain direction and that completely got cut off. Like you said, you're going and doing what you thought you needed to do. Yeah. Uh, quick nutshell, you know, grew up. The, the interesting part about this is nobody in my family played sports whatsoever. The story goes, my dad was coming home from work and he was late getting home. Mom said, where you been? He's like, I've seen the most amazing thing. He goes, I pulled over the side of the road and there was these little kids, like eight, nine year olds playing baseball. <laughs> like he didn't even know like literally existed. It was like, if we have a son, that's what he's going to do. So here, lo and behold, you know, here I come at, I guess that, you know, the story goes, like did they put some money in front of me, some balls in front of me, 
some books in front of me when I could crawl and I crawled to the ball. <laughs> and so um, from then on, you know, it was my thing. So I guess let me get a little backstory. Like my family, very low middle class. Dad was a chemical plant welder. Mom was at the time, whatever she could find for job wise. My parents would do everything they could for me to to play this game. The bats, the gloves, all those things, the cleats. Meanwhile, we sometimes didn't have lights on for a month, but I still got to play my baseball. And it was constantly like, hey, this is going to be your way to go to college. This is going to be your way to change your life. This is going to be the way to uh, change the status of our family almost. Um, So uh, go to high school, do well, still playing year round. Uh, working out all the time. You know, I, I remember sophomore on when I could drive on, I was up at 4.45 in the morning and uh, go to the local YMCA with a friend of mine. And we'd work out for an hour, then we'd go swim for an hour. You know, that was before school and then go to school and do my thing. And what it turned into there was I, I despised school so much. Mm-hmm. I, I just was not my thing, but it was a means to an end. I had to pass if I wanted to play baseball. Yeah. So I would do that. And uh, but at the same time, I was, I got treated very differently than the average student. I would walk into my English class with a body pillow and just lay down and I had a 98 in there for the whole year. Little things like that shaped who I am, who I was. Because yeah. they respected the athletes? Or- right, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, and not all the athletes, just certain ones, right? And yeah. so uh, that's why, you know, I look at as I coach, I look at people, I was like, if you think the same rules apply to every kid on this team, you're lying to yourself. So I go to college. I went to a junior college, played there, did great, had a great freshman year, then ended up having quite a few offers to play division one. So, uh, you know, I told every coach straight up, I said, I'm not greedy, but it, whoever offers me the most, because I can't afford to go anywhere, wins. So I landed at the University of New Mexico. Lo and behold, after my sophomore year at the junior college I was at, I had a a tear in my shoulder that I had to get fixed. So going into my junior year at New Mexico, I was on the disabled list and rehab for nine months. Uh, couldn't play yet. I was a pitcher. And so um, I, I get healed. I get he- healthy. I'm two weeks from being cleared. The season's about to start. I'm looking over and it looks like I could win a starting job within the next month or so if I can get on the mound and prove myself. And my surgery blows out again. And my bicep tendon detached completely from my shoulder and I was done. So I went into the doctor and, you know, I said, what are the chances of me getting back to where I was? And he was like, 85% chance you'll never, you know, break 70 miles an hour, which is telling me I'm done. So this started a just spiral, God, just a dark, dark, dark place. So at, at about the same time, I was, I was still rehabbing, trying to get back after the second surgery. And the coaches from New Mexico came to me and offered me a spot as their student coach the next year. And they were like, you know, and if you get healthy, you can be a player coach, which we all knew I wasn't going to get healthy. So I just chose to shut it down. I was like, I always wanted to be a coach. I'll start my coaching career. Well, I did that, but I didn't continue going to school. Even the next year, uh, signing up for school because they took my scholarship because I wasn't a player anymore. So here I am trying to afford, you know, 25 grand a year. And then I couldn't qualify for financial aid for some reason. However, I didn't tell anybody. I would show up to the coach's office at 10, 11 o'clock, throw my book bag down that was full of nothing. My parents back home, they thought I was in class. I was class going great. My uh, girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, you know, I'm lying to her. I'm lying to everybody. And then finally, my girlfriend figured it out. That semester, my parents were pretty much like, hey, you're coming home. So I came home. That's whenever it really got bad because now here I am, I'm 22 years old, roughly. I'm sitting at home. You know, my best friends in life are still out there. College is playing. Who am I? What am I to, to be completely candid? I remember kind of having a conversation with, with God. I was like, you know what? I said my whole life, I, I kept my hair short. I was clean cut. Yes, sir. No, sir. I didn't get into trouble. This is what you wanted me to do. This is what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to keep doing this and you're not going to let me do it. So since following your way didn't work out, I'm going to go the other way. 
the the personification turned into long hair, big, huge beard, got a ton of tattoos. I was drinking five, six nights a week. And that was about 18 months straight of that life. My parents wouldn't know where I was for weeks at a time, just crashing where I could, get a job here and there. And for me, so tie it back into the masculinity, I walked on to our old high school field one morning. And my coach, who was my high school coach, I'd, I'd been gone away from my parents' place for probably two or three weeks. Hadn't slept much, but I just, for some reason, strolled on the field and he was watering the dirt or whatever. And I was like, hey, coach, what's going on? And he was like, hey, it's so good to see you. He goes, you know how I can tell you're wanting to do the right things? And I hadn't seen this man in probably two years. And I was like, what's that? He goes, you come around. When I don't see you, especially when I know you're living in town, I, I fear and I pray for you. But whenever I see you, I know that you want to do the right things. And so this man, he had a hand in saving me. He, even though I didn't finish school, he was like, hey, why don't you come be one of my assistant coaches? So I went to the high school every day, assistant coach, travel, coached their summer league baseball team. And he did that just so I would be around. Yeah. There was no judgment from him. He 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 had heard stories. Everybody had. Probably the big thing was is I got I got this really coveted job at this company. I'm from from a small town outside of Houston, and everybody wanted to get on, but you couldn't. However, my ex girlfriend at the time, who's still my wife, but she she was smart <laughs> enough to walk away to back away from. Yeah. <laughs> she was like she she was she was like figure it out. Longtime family church friend was the general manager of this place and. She called him and then also one of my best friends who I kind of severed ties with because he was a good kid. Um, his mom was high up in the company. So both of these people behind my back called and urged this man to give me a job. And he did. 90 days later, I got fired for failing a drug test. Everybody in this small town knows what's going on. We're my coach. No judgment, no nothing. Just a safe harbor. Just whatever I needed, whatever, like without me even asking, he was just there. Okay. So just to contrast this, because yeah. I think I remember you saying when you became of no value to the, the college, oh, was, yeah. they turned completely. Yeah. Yes and no. So when I became no value, I remember it was in the summer I was coaching and they came to me and said, hey, can we have your, your money? I said, what do you mean? They're like, can you have your scholarship? I said, well. I didn't think I could have, they're like, no, you, you know, you're, you're, you were injured on our field. So your scholarship is still honored until you graduate. Or if you really want to help the team for the price we paid for you, we could get two shortstops. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Because again, one being a people pleaser that I, that I am and was more than, and then two, you know, here's my identity, right? Like, okay. I can't do what I want to do anymore, what I'm supposed to do, but I can help this team find somebody that can. So vicariously, I can still do it. So yeah, that's when the value disappeared. And then a lot of that was from my rejection of my own self. I wasn't devalued necessarily by them because they saw value in another realm. They just didn't have value in me as a player anymore, which was true. I couldn't play. I took that more as like, as a human, I'm not valuable. And at that age, that's, oh, God. that I mean, makes sense, right? Yeah. You don't I have mean, the wisdom. No, absolutely. And looking at it now, it's like, yeah, I, I'm zero, worth nothing. And then coming home. So, you know, I, I put that little anecdote about the body pillow in there, right? Because that's how valuable I was, that I could do whatever I wanted. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm back and people are turning away people yeah. are ashamed of here's a hometown boy who didn't make good that complex oh my goodness shaped me all the way through man i would say until i don't know 2016 17 so quite a while oh yeah it just just baggage you know it wasn't until till i could sit there with some some men and just air out and then look at me and at certain times tell me i'm wrong in my thinking and then sometimes tell me it's okay, but also, you know, goes back to addressing it. You know, I, I have something that I wrote that says, you know, blame Jesus. And it's it's me telling that story about how I blame Jesus for all the things that I didn't get. And it didn't hurt anybody but me. You know, the ripple effect that I now see over like a two, three year prop, uh, time period during that, it broke some people. 
even my wife. I mean, she bears scars from that time period. You know, it makes us know each other better, but it was really hard. And it all comes from a place of identity. What's my identity? Who am I? Who, who, what am I worth? Who am I worth to now? Looking my dad in the face and being like, well, I guess I'm going to go work in the chemical field now, just like you do. Sorry, I let you down. Which he never expressed that, but that's what I felt. You knowing that everything he did and all the sacrifices that they made was for you so that you wouldn't have to do that. Right. And that there's and there lies the 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 baggage. Carrying hopes and dreams is a lot lighter than carrying shame and regret and guilt. And so being the the son who was supposed to go be the golden child and turning it into just this lump of unformed rock that does nothing but sink. There's certain things that no one can help you get through. There's some things that as an individual, you have to come to grips with before anybody else can actually pour into you. I think it's just acknowledgement. This is what I'm feeling because you lie to yourself so much because it hurts so much to feel things and, and you just suppress, suppress, suppress. That's what we're trained to do. And it's what we're conditioned to do because it's weak if you show it. And, and really what happens is it makes you so weak inside. And if you're supposed to be the pillar or the cornerstone or foundation, whatever it may be, whatever language you want to use for your family and your community, if you're weak, the things that are, are standing on your shoulders are going to fall and they're going to be hurt. I think you have to acknowledge those feelings and take time to sit in them for a while. Because if you don't, they'll run you. That, that's where I think the self-work has to happen. I do think yeah. from an outside perspective, say there's a mom out there and you have a son and you don't know, just like, I don't know how to talk to my son right now. I don't know what it's like to go through the situation that he is because I'm a woman and he's a young man. I would urge that mom to just sit down and say, what are you feeling? What is it like? Describe to me what's going on in you. Because what you're doing is you're making them confront that feeling. And maybe when they go into their room or they're on a drive or whatever it may be, or they're at work, they might sit there and start thinking about it. Yeah, I'm thinking as you're saying this, as a parent, I do, and I'm sure a lot of people do, we always want to jump into solving it mode, trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. And to like take that time to try to understand those feelings first. Would you give the same advice to the fathers? I would I would say first as a as a father, as a as another male, if you haven't experienced it, then experience it first. For the man out there that feels trapped or lost or alone or like he's holding up the world without anybody knowing, go lock yourself away. Go go in your room, go in a closet, whatever, go on a drive. If you're a deer hunter, go to your lease. And just sit and, and don't try to fight. Just sit there. And then from there, your obligation, I believe, as a man is to build up the next generation and to make it better. I, I want my children to have more options than I had. And when I say options, I don't necessarily mean like job, house, car, living conditions. I mean more options to be a better human, to make their own healthy lifestyle decisions. It's, it's, it's even biblical. There's, there's certain things that you're supposed to do for the next generation. You know, educating them about the Lord is, is first and foremost. However, if you're, you're taking your time and doing your diligence, all of this is a part of that, you know, learning, teaching to love. Yeah. yeah that's what it's. The, the self is there. The ego is there. The, there's some natural good things about the ego and the self that, that are inherently put in us. But just like anything else in this world, there's also a light and a dark side to everything we have. And it's just whichever one we feed, whichever one we cultivate. I would urge men, if, if, if you haven't exercised huh, getting to know yourself and getting to know your feelings and to do it and then, and then find an opportunity as soon as you can to pass it on specifically to a younger generation because it's so healing. And like you said, we have no idea when these weeds that are planted deep, deep inside us, when they're going to rear up. And a lot of times they rear up in anger or revenge or just malicious yeah. actions. Yeah. Yeah, they do. 
And, you know, I do think that's a great argument. If you can't do it for yourself, do it for the people that you love. Do that inner work for the people that you love, because whatever is in you is going to be projected out onto other Mm -hmm. people. Whenever Jesus is asked, you know, what's the highest commandment, right? Love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And he says, the other one, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that last as yourself, if you don't love yourself, that's how much you're going to love your neighbor. There's a debt that you have to settle with yourself before you can pay it forward to anybody else. When it comes down to it, we lie to ourselves or we have the ability to lie to ourselves on a daily basis about who we are, what we feel. We also perceive that others perceive the lie that we're telling ourselves. When most of the time the people that are closest to us are actually experiencing the true self. And if it's not in the place where it should be, then it's very jagged and and easy to cut. uh, Yeah. Um, You know, learning to love yourself and then offering that healing that you received to others. When you went back and you were in such a state and your high school coach didn't have anything really to gain, but he knew that your life was worth everything, just pouring himself into you, giving you a place there. Maybe that started part of your healing journey that, that led you to where you are now. His selfless... The contrast he showed me was um, he knew me since I was 11 and then played through high school with him. And so he knew how to push and prod me, how to get the best version of Luke Smith on a baseball field there could be. However, fast forward to this time period, it was probably three or four months. Saw the man every day. There was never a time whenever he challenged my effort. And I believe it's because somewhere inside of him, he knew I was giving everything I had at that time. And just showing up was all he required of me. Probably all you could do at that time. Probably looking at it. Probably so. It was just um, the fake it till you make it attitude. You know, I lived that mantra my whole life. Every, it's just what you hear. However, I've, I've ceased to, to use it. And it's more of just show up. Just show up and and be open to what can happen. Show up as much as you can without an ulterior motive. Show up as much as you can without a selfish motive. And show up with an attitude of humility, grace, wanting to provide service, wanting to enrich someone else. And if and if you do that, you'll you'll find that you'll learn a whole lot about who you used to be compared to about who you will be. Yeah, and I think finally, for me, just looking at you and seeing what you're you're accomplishing in your life, um, you're just so committed and sold out to your family. I mean, you have some very big boundaries, and you have time set aside, and you've really entered this deep partnership with your wife. It's like that's the important thing. This is our vision for these children to grow up and mm-hmm. learn love and be loved and see love between the two of us. There's so much pressure on men to be an entrepreneur, or do better, or do better than your dad did or whatever. Mm-hmm. Just being a great man to your family and people around you and whoever is brought into your life, whoever your neighbor is at that moment, that's the life you're living. And that's the love that will change the world. I think so. I, I think it's... It's true. It, it's it remains true. Is doing sacrificial things out of love without expecting anything in return. You know, to touch on the family situation. You know, I have five children. Uh, four of them girls. Ten, eight, five, three, and we had our son Christmas Eve. So he's three or four months right now. It's a full house. It's never quiet. Mondays are my days to where I call them my meditation Monday, which really what it is, it's just a day for me to just kind of be silent and to watch my family and interact with them. But really, it's just for me to sit and enjoy them and and enjoy what what I've been given. Saturdays, my my daughters, they call it Dadder Day. Dadder Day? Yeah. and, And Dadder Day is the day where it's all bets are off. You come over on a Dadder Day and you're going to you might see me dressed up as Maui with a paddle. My phone is kept locked up in my room. 
And if my wife has some stuff she needs to go do or wants to get out, that's when she does it. And so it's just me and my crew. You have to find it, right? You have to find the time for your family. You have to find your time for yourself. You you said something that, that really triggered something in me. Never once have I heard a young man or say, I just want to be a father. Mm. I just, I just want to be a husband. Like you ask my five-year-old right now, what do you want to be when you grow up? She will look at you and say, I want to be a mom and have 10 kids. Yeah. And we wear so many hats, but as fathers and husbands and men, you know, we're the, we're the client manager, we're the, we're the boss or we're the husband. You know, I think it was your last guess. Maybe it was Chad. Was he the one that said second shift is when you get home or he quoted yeah. somebody else? Yeah, uh, clock in. Oh my God. I subscribe to that. I Whenever I was in the work world and coming coming home, I made sure that I was recharged. And, and for me, I would actually, whenever I first started trying to get into this, I would shut my door of my truck whenever I pulled in my driveway and I'd get to the front door and, and I would I would ask God for energy, right? Mm. Please give me, and this is after, you know, being at the office at 5 a.m., it's six o'clock in the evening, whatever it is, because it was go time. That's my game day. And I saw what it did for my wife too. Loving the kids that way and her, it gave her a breath after 12 hours of being alone with all these crazy kids we have. You know, be like, hey, go upstairs, take a bath, whatever, I'm here. And it wasn't easy. And it was something I had to consciously change about myself. But the, the dad that comes home, stumbles into the living room, passes out in the chair, I get it. You're tired, but you're missing out on some amazing opportunities to experience some love. You know, that that's probably one thing I will say that I learned really well from my dad, being a construction worker, being outside all day. He's he's still the same guy up at 3:30 in the morning, home at 5:30 in the afternoon. I I remember I'd get home, do my homework, and then all of a sudden I'd typically feel my glove hit me on the stomach. Let's go play catch. Like right when he got home, he's filthy head to toe, been out in the elements. That it was daily. It was absolutely every day. And so that's what I would do. I'd crank the radio up in my truck and just get as energetic and excited as I could. And I would just start walking through the door like it was party time. Party time. (laughs) You know, you're definitely living kind of counterculturally. And I am hopeful that that's kind of the way we're going, you know, more of an embrace of the traditional family and people are seeing that all this consumerism, it doesn't really do anything but give you more stuff that you have to deal with. That real value is in the relationships that you're, you're forming. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's all about people. Well, again, I, I just really appreciate you, you know, paying it forward for, for helping my mm-hmm. family. And I, I really love talking to you and hearing about the things that you do to, to make your life successful. Well, thank you so much. And that's that's the other thing, too, is my definition of success has altered greatly. You know, it, from the outside in, a lot of people would see all different aspects and consider it successful. For me, it's how my family's doing and yeah. then how my how my relationship with with Christ is doing. If I'm not if I'm not chasing after Christ first, then I can't chase after my wife appropriately. And then if I can't chase after her, I can't chase. I can't pursue my children appropriately either. So I have to have that order. My wife can see the way that I love my relationship with the Lord, then she's more likely to let me love her that way. And if my kids see me love her sacrificially and from a point of pure heart, then they'll allow me to love that way. And in hopes, what they're learning is they'll act the same out in the world. And I think what you're saying, and I mentioned this in the last episode as well, it's easy to surrender to someone who is surrendered. Oh, yes. That's and good. as you're surrendered to your source or Christ, and your wife can see that, it's easy for her to surrender to you. And then it just keeps falling into place. I will, I will add this for, for, for the man out there that's like, okay, I've done this, and um, my wife's not responding in this way. It wasn't overnight. Because my wife did not trust the fact that I was this way now. Yeah. And and it's okay. Thank you so much for joining. All the best to you and your your family. And I'm sure they're waiting for you to talk to them. Thank you. And and to reiterate to you, I'm so excited 
and energized to to hear your heart. It's, it's um, from a man's perspective, it's so refreshing to hear a woman care about the inner makeup and the healing of a man because so many women don't see that because they're taught the same thing. That's not a strong man. It's just, I think it's very valuable that, that you're doing this. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that sometimes it feels like being a stranger in a strange land and (laughs) so thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm